Facebook. We're getting listens every week. Thank you for the work that you put into that, Doug. Uh, some of the messages are going out. I mean, we're getting, some people may say, well, that ain't much. We're getting about 50 listens off of many of them. 50 people that are not here, maybe that's y'all. I don't know who's listening. We don't know that. But we know that they're, we're getting subscribers now. So that's what we want. We want the gospel to go out. I don't know where it's going from there. Somebody share it on Facebook because it, it just keeps on going and going. I had a lady contact me. I don't even know where she was at. She was thanking me for the word. Now, no thanks to me. All praise be to him. So I'm moving again this morning towards, I've been calling this, I started last week, Holy Fires of Worship. This morning I'm going to get into just a couple of things. I'm talking to you about the priesthood of believers, and I'm going to talk to you some about the rebirth of Melchizedek. So I want to find this morning John chapter 4, and we're going to read this again. We read it last week. I'm just going to read a couple of uh, verses from this. If you didn't get to hear last week's message, some... Uh, you may feel like you're missing some of the gaps here, but I'll, I'll try to recapture some of that. Like I said, you can go back and, and listen to it in your own time. There's a lot of information that I put out there last week concerning worship. Okay, One of the things that I'm beginning to talk to this church about is the priesthood of believers. You know, We are, by faith, uh, we have been deemed, I suppose, uh, Protestants. We're not Catholic. Uh, we've I've been part of a reformation that began in 1500 and it was a return to justification by faith uh, that was started by a Catholic monk whose name was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther uh, preached two primary things. And one was justification by faith and secondly he preached the priesthood of all believers Somehow in the midst of this 500-year gap, we're still preaching justification by faith. But if you begin to go out and examine whether the priesthood of all believers is being taught, I've found by my own experience in the last 22 years that the majority of the body of Christ that are Protestant believers, that they know little to nothing about their priesthood ministry. So we have allowed this to fall through the cracks and we need to have a revival and recapture that which has become lost to us. And this needs to be raised up again because this changed the church 500 years ago. And I believe that it will bring much needed change in our day as well. So with no further ado uh, on that, I want to move to John chapter 4 because I want to look at what Jesus said. John chapter 4, I'm looking at verses 21 through 24. Jesus is in Samaria. He's passing through. And there's a woman that he meets at a well. And she's coming at an odd hour. She's coming in the middle of the day to draw water. You don't usually go out uh, in the hottest part of the day to do this. You would go early in the morning. But she's met him uh, at about noontime. And she's come there to draw water. And Jesus, uh, in his encounter with her, he has asked her for water. He said, give me something to drink. And she questioned him, and she says, How is it that you're talking to me because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan? And Jesus said to her, If you knew who was talking to you, you would have asked him, you would have asked me for water. He said, Because the water that I give you, when you drink it, you will never thirst again. Because the water that I will give you will be living water. And she said, Sir, give me this water. And he said, Go call your husband. And she said, I have no husband. He said, that's right. You have had five. And she said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Let's move on. Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming. I want you to know that Jesus began to talk to her about worship. He says that when, when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. We have been finding out that worship had become confined to locations. Jesus says to her that the time is coming, or the hour, and it already is. We'll go on here. He says, you worship and you don't know what you're worshiping. We know what we worship for salvation is the Jews. Verse 23, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers 
worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Holy Father, I thank you this morning for the communication of your word. Lord, I thank you that through the preaching of the gospel, you make known the intentions of your heart. Lord, this morning, that's what we want to know. We want to tap into and see, Lord, what it is that you want to communicate to us. I believe, Lord, that at the communication of the gospel, that this is not in word only. But, Lord, this is in the spirit, this is in power, and it comes with, Lord, much assurance. God, I thank you this morning that, Lord, that every individual that's either here this morning, including myself, or, Lord, someone who listens to this by some other means, that, Holy Spirit, you speak, Lord, to that individual. That's my prayer, that you speak to them. God, you speak to them something that is deeper than their mind and their thoughts, but, Lord, something that is in their heart. God, what you have planted in the heart, Lord, I pray you begin to cause to spring forth unto life and life eternal. And I praise you, Lord, for this word being established in their hearts. In Jesus' name. So we've been finding out here that Jesus is telling her that there's, there is a change that's coming and that change has already happened and it's already happening because worship is not going to be confined to a location such as Jerusalem or in the mountains of Samaria. He says that true worshipers, true worshipers, there's a difference. A true worshiper is going to worship God. I have to look at that, that true worshipers worship and they not only worship, but they worship in spirit and in truth. We marked last week once again that God is looking for worshipers. He is actively seeking them. So we began to take this to another level and find that God is not just seeking for believers and seeking for followers, but the Father is looking for a worshiper. So we've been finding that through this that the the end, we'll call it, of discipleship is that a disciple not only is one who follows, but one who learns how to worship God and how to worship Him in spirit and in the truth. So the processes of discipleship in Christianity is not only to develop a believer and develop his prayer life but to and his faith life, but to develop that individual as a worshiper a worshiper of God because he says that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we're finding also that God is in an active pursuit and this is more than just our pursuit of him and our pursuit of our own lives. We are finding that God is in pursuit of people and God is looking for a worshiper and God is looking for someone that he can show himself strong to. That's what the Bible says, that his eye is running to to and fro throughout the old, whole earth. Did you know that God's eye passes over you? I don't know how often, but it may be on a daily basis. It may be on an every minute basis. God is looking to and fro throughout the earth, and he's looking, for, he's looking for you to worship him. Do you know why? Because God has faith, and God believes that you are going to worship him. God believes that about you because he created you to worship him. Did you know that that's what God created you to do? You were created to worship. God did not create you for, we, many times we believe that, that this is my purpose and that is my purpose and I'm seeking this purpose. Did you know that if you will begin to seek what God is seeking, in the midst of that seeking, you will find your purpose because your purpose was to worship. For thus you were created to worship the Creator. So last week I made a couple of points here. And I'll reiterate these before I move forward. Those who become worshipers also realize that they need to become holy. If I'm going to worship God, I worship Him in or for, not only for His holiness, but we have found through Scripture, and I'm not going to give you all those again today. You can go back and listen. But a worshiper has to become holy. Not only to worship God for His holiness, but to worship Him in holiness. Second, last week, I brought up that worship is a state of humbling oneself or to lower self. We found out that I must lower myself. Self in my life must find 
or position. If I'm going to be a worshiper of the Father, then self has to find not a high place, it finds the lowest place. It finds the lowest seat in my life. Matter of fact, Jesus said if you were going to follow him, that you were going to have to deny yourself and, f and take up your cross and follow him. That's Luke 9, 23, if you want to write it down and look it up in your own time. Third, we found out that the worshiper becomes encapsulated to know what is spirit and what is truth. Amen. He must find out what is spirit and what is truth because he realizes that he can only worship God in these. Do you hear what I said? Jesus said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So it becomes not only our pursuits to uh, become holy. You know, it is my pursuit now to become a worshiper of God. It's not something that happens instantaneous in our life. It becomes a lifelong pursuit of becoming a worshiper of God. And in that becoming, I must become holy. And I must understand holiness because I cannot see God without holiness. We found that out last week. No man shall see the Lord without holiness. So we also are finding out that I must begin an active movement in my life away from selfishness, selfish desires, uh, being self-will, being self-consumed. And self must find the lowest place. Third again, that the worshiper begins an active pursuit to know what is spirit and what is truth. I won't reiterate those much longer here. I'm going to move forward because I need to get into this. One of the things that I'm going to begin to bring up to you here as we move forward, and you can go ahead and find 1 Peter. Let's go ahead and find 1 Peter chapter 2. Is where we begin to find out when you study worship. How many of you ever studied worship throughout the Bible? If you haven't, this needs to become something that you begin to pursue because God is looking for worshipers. If God's looking and seeking a worshiper, then I need to know what God is looking for. You know, last week we talked about that many times we're looking for fulfillment in life and we're looking to, to uh, we're looking all over. People are looking high and low. You know, is it there? What I'm, you know, somebody's looking for somebody to make them happy. You know, maybe they're looking for a man. They're looking for a woman. They, they're looking for something. Something to make them happy. Something to make them feel fulfilled. You know, I related this last week. It's like, you know, you've lost a dollar and you're looking for it. I know I put that money somewhere and you realize that in the midst of this, that God is looking for something more valuable and more important than what we are looking for. Amen. You begin, if you realize that somebody lost a million dollars in your house, you stop looking for your dollar and you start going, my Lord, is, am I going to get a reward? And God says that he is the rewarder yeah. of those that diligently seek him. So, I began to realize in this that I need to stop looking for what I'm looking for and start looking for what he's looking for. And in my looking for what he's looking for, I began to find my purpose. It is to be found in him. And to be found, I want to be found as a, I want God to find me as a worshiper. So through this, and we will begin to look at some of this. I don't expect to get all of this out today. Worship many times throughout scripture was conducted at a fire. You know, it's, I find it strange. This church is called the fire. When, when we prayed about a name change years ago, this is what the Lord had given us, is for this place to be called the fire. And that was taken out of Leviticus 6.13, where God had said that the fire that he had put upon the altar, that they were to never let it go out. Did you know that God can start something, but we let it go out? We, through our service to God, we are to lay the wood in order, as he told the priest, and they were to keep the fire going. So that tells me something, that God can initiate something, but yet puts a responsibility upon us to keep it or tend to it, and if we don't, then it goes out. So worship was primarily conducted at a fire, a brazen altar, or many times a stone altar in the Old Testament. So worship, by definition, I need you to know this, it originates from...
Old meaning. The word worship comes from an old English word. Uh, very hard for me to pronounce because I don't speak old English that well. But it's like we earthy ship. And it comes from a meaning to build. The word ship means to build something. So in our modern English, I'm trying to grab where we got this word from. And this word worship, literally in its root of English, means to build something. Grab hold of that. Worship is to build. Worship is to build. We are building in worship, moving forward. Hence, this is why wherever we find, you can look this up real quick if you want to, in Genesis 8 and verse 20, the Bible says that Noah built an altar and he sacrificed. We find that Noah built arts, or altars, excuse me, not only an ark, but he built an altar. Let's look at this real quick if you want to. Genesis 8 and verse 20, just so we can capture what I'm talking about here. If you go through the book of Genesis, you begin to see that not only Noah built an altar, but we find that Abraham built an altar, Isaac built an altar, and Jacob, they were all altar builders. So in Genesis 8 and verse 20, let me get there real quick. It says, And Noah built in an altar unto the Lord, and he took every clean beast and every clean fowl, and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. A curse was broken by the worship of Noah. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more any more every living thing as I have done. Did you realize here that this was Noah's worship to the Lord and this changed the course of humanity? Worship begins to change the course of humanity. Not only had God smitten the earth by a flood, but when, listen to me, when Noah began to worship the Lord, a curse was also lifted. Lord have mercy. Some people just need to get into worship and many curses would be lifted off their life. We'll find throughout scripture, you can write these down for yourself. Abraham built an altar. He built more than one altar. Everywhere that he went and he encountered the Lord. My wife talked about this this morning some before we got into worship. They built altars and worship is building of an altar. I need to move forward here. For the most part, worship was considered sacrificing at an altar. Make a special note of that. Throughout most, I said most, not all, throughout most of the Old Testament, worship was considered sacrificing at an altar. Y'all still got 1 Peter 2, right? Don't forget where I'm going. For the most part, worship was considered for you to bring a sacrifice to an altar. Moving forward, until David. Now David is a very special character in Scripture. You will find that in the midst of your scripture that the book of Psalm is almost slap dab in the middle of the Bible. It is the largest book in the Bible and it is all songs and worship to God. Until David, he made a move by, by the Spirit. He separated the Ark of the Covenant from out of the established order by which God had prescribed by Moses, listen to me for just a minute, and he began to establish something that seemed unlawful. He took the Ark of, of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, which contained the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron, and a pot of manna. It had these articles within it. And upon this Ark is where God... His presence, his Shekinah glory, would appear unto the children of Israel. This same ark is the place in which atonement was made for the sins of the people. David seeming here as not one who was of a Levitical priest, it would seem unlawful for David to do what he has done. David said that God had placed in his heart to build him a house. And in the building of this house, it was not going to be like the former house. So he separated 
covenant from the altars and the tabernacle. Matter of fact, you can do your own study and maybe I'll preach on this sometime, Lord willing. At that time of David's early life, the tabernacle of Moses was at Shiloh when they entered into the land of Israel. David went down to a place called kirjath Jerem. This is where the tabernacle had been moved to. The tabernacle still moved around inside of Israel. The priests moved it. I suppose that they moved whenever the high priest said, the Lord wants us to go over here. But at kirjath Jerem, David goes down and he takes the ark. And he doesn't go in the manner prescribed by the word of God. And he, he encounters some problems with this and somebody winds up dying. Anyway, the whole gist of all of this is that David is in a pursuit of the presence of God. And he, he even says when Uzzah died, you know, he called the name of that place Perez Uzzah. It means that there was a breach upon Uzzah. And he was very saddened in his heart that someone died uh, while, while he was pursuing to do what God had put in his heart. So he went back and sought the Lord about it and he found out that he did not do things according to due order. He realized that he had to get the priesthood involved in this movement. Yeah. Yeah, listen to me. This is what you begin to find out as a worshiper of God. That you in your prayer closet alone cannot do what God wants done. You have to get the priesthood and the church of Jesus Christ, you have to get them involved in this worship to begin to move toward what God wants. And what God wants is God wants a holy habitation. God wants a place where he can manifest his presence in all of his fullness and all of his glory. Somehow we have lost this in the midst of Christianity and we have taken on uh, just our liturgic... Uh, services and our routines and the preaching of doctrine let me tell you something the church of jesus christ in this day must recapture a manifesting of god's presence that begins to begin a, a, an overload on the society an overload on the land david had an understanding that what he had been experiencing with god when he was out tending sheep and worshiping the lord that this was not only available to him, but it was available to the entire nation. Yeah. He had in his heart to take this to the whole nation. The, the whole tabernacle, you can study this in your own time, the tabernacle and the priest, after the ark was moved, they went to Gibeah, and the ark went to Jerusalem. They continued to do sacrifice, and without the ark, they continued to conduct services without the ark. David seems to be doing what is unlawful. He has built for God a house that has no altar, no candlestick, no veil, nothing. It is not even according to the former. That does not relegate, nor does it take away from what God had instructed Moses. You've got to follow me here very closely. He began to hold services. Listen to me. David began to hold services of worship apart from the sacrificial and burnt offering system. Whew. Hold on to me. Don't let go right here because we're going to run with this. This transition began, it began to add what Israel was missing, a spiritual dimension to the priesthood that was outside of Levitical order. I'm trying to tell you something. The church has been conducting services for the same way for so long that it does not even realize that there is something more than what we have been doing. I have realized through my own prayer life and worship with God that there is more than the current experience. But it is not God's intention for us to just experience this on an individual basis. It is God's intention that we experience this when we are all together. So David begins a transition that is a spiritual transition. Before this, only the Levites were considered to be priests, but there was another order that existed. Oh yes, God had revealed this before Moses. God had revealed this before... Lord, y'all better listen to me. Because Jesus said before Abraham was and before... Lord, before...
because I am. There has been a high priest who has an order that has, he is of the highest order, and that order was in existence before all of this. Before this, listen. This is an order that existed that is without law. When you go and visit the, the tabernacle of Moses, and if I had time I could show you, there's all kind of rules, regulations, laws. You can't do this. You can't do that. Did you know that if you came and worshipped, listen to me real close on this. If you came and worshipped at the tabernacle of Moses, you could not go into the presence of God. David has taken this. And he has taken from that order what God originally established with Adam. A place of fellowship and communion that is a place where there is no reservations, no limits of access. This is what we will see that David is bringing forth a rebirth of the order of Melchizedek. How many of you are familiar with Melchizedek? Amen. The Bible says that he was a high priest and he was also the king. Mark this, he was the king of Salem or the king of, at that time it would have been, it was Salem, but it was also known as Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He met Abraham when Abraham returned from battle and Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. You need to read Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. Mark that, in, mark that down in your notes. You need to go read Mel, excuse me, Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. And begin to get an understanding of Melchizedek. So let's look this morning. I'm going to move quickly. I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to establish something here with you is the understanding, first of all, that if you are a believer in Christ, if you are a believer in Christ, then you have been called to a priesthood. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, You also, as lively stones, you are, are built up. Notice the building. We said that worship is building. You are built up. A spiritual house, a spiritual house, a house, a house is a dwelling place. A house is a habitation for somebody. What I'm talking to you about is not your house, it is God's house. You are building up, you're building up a spiritual house through worship. You are a holy priesthood, mark that, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. Look at somebody this morning around you and tell them, you have been called to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. Let's look at the one other verse before I move forward. Verse 9. Peter says, you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, mark this in your Bible, that you are not only a holy priesthood, you are part of a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. I said you are not only part of a holy priesthood, but you are part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar. You're going to look strange. You're going to be different. Amen. My God, if you're going to worship God in this generation, in this society, you are going to look different. that you may show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I'm going to make a couple of notes. If you're making notes, you better write quick. If you're a believer in Christ, then you have been called into an order. You have been called into an order. You have been called to be a priest. You have been called to build up a spiritual habitation. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? You have been called to build. You have been called to build an altar. That's what we're doing here. We are building an altar of worship unto the Lord. 
Every time that God appeared to Abraham or wherever, wherever Abraham was going, when God appeared to him, he built an altar unto the Lord and he sacrificed by fire. You have been called to an order. Not only that, but you have been called to live holy, to be sanctified. You know that the priest, they always had to be sanctified. Something I need to tell you about Levitical priesthood is that it is a shadow of what was to come. And that which was to come was already before that which came, which is a shadow. Y'all better hear what I'm saying because there is no shadow with God. There's no shadow of turning. Before all of this, Jesus was already demonstrating an order that was to come. Did you know that God, listen to me, God is not defined by or confined by your time. He's already gone before you. The Bible says that he's a forerunner. He's already gone before you. He is outside of your time. He's outside of your years. He's outside of your days. He's outside of your watch and your clock. A priesthood must be anointed. If you have claimed that you are a Christian, then you have claimed that you are anointed. Christian means an anointed one. Not the anointed one, but a, an anointed one. Fourth, priests are called to serve in offerings. And these offerings are worship. They conduct services. Hear what I'm telling you. You are the priesthood of God. It is not just me and April. You have been con called to conduct worship. High five somebody. You've been called to conduct worship. Just because you may not play guitar does not mean that you're not a conductor of worship. She is only, listen to me, she is not up here to do the worship. This is where the church has gone wrong. The church has hired people to do the worship. This order is completely wrong. That's not what God ordered. You know when God orders something, if he pulled up at Burger King and said, I want a Whopper and fries, he expects a Whopper and fries. God has made an order, and he has ordered that his house be full of priests and that these priests are conducting the worship. They are conducting. So you are the worshipers that are, I want you to think next week when you walk through this door. I want you to think, I am here to conduct worship. I didn't ask you whether you could sing. You can make a joyful noise, can't you? You got hands. You can raise them. I'm talking about you conducting the worship. See, this is where the church has gone wrong. It has put, it has put so much on a few. I'm throwing it the other way. I'm putting, the, I'm putting this on the people because this is how God intended for his house to be run. He intended for the people he intended for you to be the worshipers. God, listen, when, when, the, when the Lord passes over this place on Sunday morning, he's not looking and saying, well, Todd Naples worshiping. He's looking out here and saying, where's the worshipers? That's who I'm looking for. God's looking for you to worship, not for my wife to sing you a song. That's why I will stand up here and say almost every Sunday, we are not here to sing songs. We're not. I don't show up for that reason. I don't come here to play drums. I got a set at home. They're sitting in my son's room. I could go in there and beat on them. I come here not to preach. I got sidewalks I can do that on. I come here to worship God. But I understand that in the making of disciples, disciples don't happen. They have to be made. And I understand this as well, that I am not going to exceed my prayer closet and my worship life without you. I must understand what he was talking about when he was talking about the order of Melchizedek, that some have forsaken the assembling of themselves together. I am not going to forsake the assembly because of frustration, because the people don't want to go there. I've decided I'm going to get down in here with the people and I'm going to get out the word of
We're going to look at it and see what God's Word says and how we are to order ourselves and how we are to conduct ourselves when we are in the house of God. Did you know that, that, that Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, he said that you should know how to behave yourself in the house of God. I ain't talking about you just backbiting, not backbiting people. And Paul wasn't talking about that, on how to behave yourself. The behaving of oneself in the house of God has to have a particular freedom to it. The ministry of the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they have to establish an order of freedom with God's people that the people of God have the freedom to worship and they have the freedom to worship without somebody thinking something strange about them. Let me tell you this. The establishment of the order of this house is this. If you come in and you do not worship, you will look strange. That's why Peter goes on and he says, they will think you strange. This is the normal for us. The normal mode of operation for us is to be exuberant worshipers, to walk in the zeal of God, to not be ashamed, to not be afraid. And if you sit on that, you will look strange. Because I'm going to shout, I'm going to glorify the Lord. You know, I've been in, I've been in I, Lord, I remember some churches I've been in with less, and it was quiet. And Les would say, hallelujah. hallelujah. And you, people turn around. <laughs> it just upset. It, I think we should be the other way. I'm not shouting for other people. I'm not shouting for you. I'm not shouting to entertain you. I'm not dancing, worshiping, living. I'm not doing it for you. I don't even play drums for you. So if you don't like my beat, I'm sorry. I'm not doing it for you. I am playing for the Lord. Amen. That's when I, when I sit down back there, I say, Holy Spirit, let me play for you. Glory to God. Teach my fingers to war. Amen. Because, oh Lord, he sends forth praise Judah into battle first. Amen. May the sound that comes forth from my fingers and my lips, may it sound like war to the enemy. May they hear a war chant going out in the spirit and they say, Oh, Lord, let us retreat. Let us get out of here because these people are they're going to bring. Did you know that Psalm 22 and verse 3 says that God inhabits the praise of Israel? That means that when we begin to praise God, that God will begin to make a habitation in the midst of our praise. I told you last week that it means that he makes that you're making a big old chair for him to come and sit down. You know, the last thing that demons want in this society and this generation is for a manifestation of God to come and sit sit down in the midst of a community because when God comes and sits down in the midst of a community, you're going to see sinners change. You're going to see people run from their houses. They're going to have visions of hell. They're going to wake up in the middle of the night and they're going to have the hell scared out of them and they're going to come running to the house of God because they don't know where else to go. We have a generation without conviction because we have a church that doesn't host the presence of God. That's why you got to make a sacrifice of worship. Yeah. So you're a holy priesthood. That means you're separate, set apart. Some people may say, well, Todd, you know, I, I'm not living a righteous life. We live this by faith in the first place. Not according to my own sacrifices. I am part of a New Testament priesthood who is not depending on the high priest of Aaron or his sons to offer up a sacrifice for me. I am totally dependent on the Son of God and His sacrifice that He has made. I'm not excusing any action or anything that we do. This is why the Apostle John said to you, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And he said, if, there, if you have sin or you have sin, confess it and he will forgive you and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's where my faith lies. It not only lies in this, but it lies that I am part of a royal priesthood. I want you to know something about yourself. You need to stop walking around with your head low and acting like you beat up all the time because that ain't your kingly nature.
you to know that Jesus has said about himself that he is the king of kings and he wasn't just talking about presidents or world leaders. He was talking about you. He has called you forth as kings and priests unto... Y'all better read your Bible. He has called you to be a king and a priest unto him. Did you know that you are kings and queens, I'll say, unto the Lord? That means that God has bestowed a certain power and authority upon you because I know that this very word, royal, means it comes from the foot. Did you know that when God establishes something royal, it's not about putting a crown on somebody's head, but rather what he has put under their feet. Lord have mercy. I'm going to preach myself happy today. If y'all ain't listening, y'all can go on home and I'll stay by myself. What God, God ain't looking just to put something on your head or crown. He's going to put something under your feet. He has put our feet or underfoot. He has put underfoot our enemies, not his. Did you know that the devil is not God's enemy? The Bible says he's your adversary. He's no match for God. I can't stand seeing that picture of Jesus and the devil arm wrestling. There ain't no match. God ain't wrestling with him. He's already conquered, already defeated. He defeated my enemy, not his own. Listen to me. Kingdoms are represented by a foot. One foot at a time. Kingdoms are measured by the foot. Oh, Lord. A kingdom has to have dominion. That's where it comes from. And if I'm part of a royal priesthood, this means that God has given me dominion. Did you know that God has given you dominion to take this land for his glory? When God caused Israel to move into the land of Israel, into the land of Canaan, he didn't put them there to just live beside their enemies. He put them there to take over. And the first thing that they took over, Lord, y'all better hear me this morning, because the first thing that they took over the Jordan was the ark. God was telling them, my presence shall go before you, and I'll be a rear guard to you. But I'm not, listen, he said, you're going to have to get them out. They're, God's already considered their enemies defeated. But they're going to have to drive them out. Oh, I love this. Because I know when I start worshiping God, it drives out demons. Did you know that when Jesus walked into a place, that unclean spirits began to cry out? Do you know why? It's because he had the spirit without measure. And it's because that he was bearing about in his body the full presence of of Jehovah God because he is God God was in Christ reconciling that's why when he walked into a place man they were like oh we know who you are you have come to but did you know also that you have this treasure in earthen vessels will you stop blocking God will you stop being a veil because God's, God is intended in this day to make for himself a people who are like the tabernacle of David. For God said that he would rebuild in Amos the tabernacle of David. And that tabernacle is you. Lord, you are the tabernacle. And you are to be a tabernacle that is without a veil. You, are, you need to stop veiling the glory of God. You need to stop sitting on God and stop being, stop being quiet. Be bold. I'm looking for radicals. I'm looking for radical Christians. I told you I'm tired of hearing about radical Islam. I want to hear about radical Christianity. Somebody goes in a mall and don't blow up themselves, but Lord, people get saved. A kingdom is represented by its lifestyle and its culture. A kingdom is represented by its lifestyle and its culture. We've got to get out of our American culture. And our American lifestyle. You have been called to something bigger. Great. Listen, I'm not anti-American. I live here. I want the best for this country and this nation. But I realize that for America to be at, his, at its best, that the church of Jesus Christ has got to be at its best. Because this is the only thing that liberates the sons of men. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And you're seeing your freedoms leave every day from this country. It's because the church has not walked in the liberty that the Spirit of God has given unto it. The God has given you a certain liberty to take dominion in this land.
Don't be silent about it. Stop being quiet. Preaching to myself if I have to. Holiness affects both of these. You know, most of the time you feel like you ain't got no dominion. It's because many times you feel like you ain't worthy. It's time for the body of Christ. The time is now for us to begin to walk above reproach. The Bible tells us that we are to awaken to righteousness and sin not. We have to make a choice to put it out of our lives. If you don't, you will continue to be put under the dominion of darkness. But God has called you, as Peter said, a royal priesthood. He has called you out of darkness into his light. I'm not mad, y'all. I'm excited. I'm not just up here preaching. I believe what I'm saying. So to conduct worship... Holy must, holiness is a must. It is a must. It is a must. We become holy. Listen, I know that Christ, through his blood, he has made me holy in my spirit. But this has to begin to flow to every aspect of my life. My mind, my will, my emotions, and even, yes, into my flesh. Because he says that he wants to... The life of Christ to be made manifest in my mortal flesh. Sometimes we got this compartmentalized idea about Christianity. Well, you know, this is, this is a, a spirit thing. God was intending when he saved your spirit, that born again creation, that it was going to take over. It's going to take over your mind. It's going to take over your flesh. It is not impossible for you to walk above the lust of these flesh. Because he says if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Somebody needs to tell you that. And if they haven't, I just did. I'll pat myself on the back for that one. You know why? Because I'm a worshiper of God. And if I'm a worshiper, I want to worship him in spirit and in truth. And if I'm a worshiping him in truth, I need to hear the truth. I don't need somebody to tickle my ears today or get out of their little feather and tell me, you know, well, Todd, it's okay. It's okay. No, I need somebody to be straight with me. Amen. Tell me the truth, because the truth sometimes hurts. Malachi chapter 3, I'm not going to read it, I'll just quote it to you. God says that he was going to purge the priesthood. Oh yes, because he said that he is a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And he said that he was going to purge the sons of Levi, that they might offer unto him an offering in righteousness. God is looking for an offering. Oh, Lord, you thought, you thought, well, I'll just bring God, I'll bring to God whatever I want to. No, God says you're going to bring what I want you to. I'm the prescriber here, not you. This ain't just a free will thing. Many times we have approached Christianity that it's just all up to my free will. Oh, no, honey, you didn't get here on your own. God drew you to himself. And if God drew you to himself, that means that he made the first step. And not only did he make the first step, but he has made the final step. And in him making the final step, he has also concluded that what you bring to him, that it is of him. That you bring to him what he has prescribed, not ourselves. So, I need to look at a couple of things before I leave. We conduct worship, right? Look at your neighbor and tell him, you conduct worship. You know, I see these job ads in the paper all the time. Such and such church looking for a worship leader. Such and such job. Did you know there's, there's, if you was looking for a job, you could find a job as a worship leader, I mean tomorrow. It's one of the toughest jobs in the church. You know, if you're a worship leader, you're going to get criticized, beat up. People don't like your style. They don't like this. They don't like a new song. You know, people, they, they criticize a pastor, a pastor's wife sometimes. Oh, Lord, you're a worship leader. I ain't talking about y'all. I ain't talking about my wife. I'm just talking about experience. I have seen worship leaders get beat to pieces. When David established a different order, it was all based on worship. That was not a blood sacrifice.
Do you hear what I'm saying? Peter henceforth tells us that we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. You cannot bring your blood or the blood of an animal to God in worship anymore. So what is a priesthood left to do? They are to offer up libations and oblations. It's no different than what Philip was talking about this morning. In one laying his life down, this is worship to God. Paul said that I would be a drink offering to the Lord, that my life would be poured out. We look and say, well, that may be a waste. And you may think that worship is a waste of your time. You haven't read your Bible. I'll tell you that you are biblically illiterate if you think that worship is a waste of time. I will make a promise to you and guarantee to you from the Word of God that if you begin to find a worship life, and it, don't start, it doesn't start no easier than this, God I worship you. I worship you. And you saying that is the beginning of you lowering yourself. In the beginning of that worship life is where God begins to change everything. Some people say, well, you know, I'm a believer, Todd. But are you a worshiper? I found out that when I came to Christ that all my problems didn't disappear. But I found a way. To make them disappear. Come on. Come on. I ain't no magician. You know what I started doing? The problem came. I believe you God. I believe. I, I, I believe you're going to get me through this. The problem didn't leave. I still see in the problem. God said, Todd, I want you to do more than believe here. Huh? It's hard enough for me to believe. He said, I want you to, to praise me. So you mean to tell me that I got to look at my problem and start praising you? Yeah, that's right. This don't make any sense to your natural man. Your natural mind says, what? There's no reason for me to praise you right here because everything's going wrong. But because you said it, because you said it, Lord, I, I'm going to do it. That's what, you know, that's what God's looking for. This is why he says in Hebrews 8 that when Christ came and he was after the order of Melchizedek, he said, sacrifice and offering you don't desire. But to do thy will, to do God's will is to do his word. When Christ, listen, Christ, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. When he was looking at the cross, he knew what was coming. He was saying, Father, cause this cup to pass. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. Because a lot of times you're looking at your circumstance and your problem. You're looking at it and you want it to go away. Faith, make it go away. God says, nah. Just start praising me. When you start praising God, when you start saying, Lord, this don't make any sense, but I praise you because you're worthy. I praise you because I know who you are. I praise you because I know your name. I praise you. I just praise you. I ain't even got to have a reason. Did you know that you start getting your eyes off the problem and you start seeing him? This is where it all changes because when you start praising him, you're not looking at your problem, but your eyes start looking at Jesus. And when your eyes start looking at Jesus, then God will begin to give you his perspective on how he sees your problem. I just gave y'all a million dollar, Lord, I just gave y'all a million dollar answer to the, most of the problems in Christian people's lives. When you start, I just gave you a key to the kingdom. Put it on your keychain and take it out of here with you. When you start praising and worshiping God, it takes your eyes off of you and off of your problems and it puts your eyes on God. And that's what you need to look at. You need to look because he's bigger than your problem. Lord have mercy. What makes me don't think I ain't got no problems. I got problems. That's why I want to come in here and lift him up. Amen. I ain't gonna come in here. And I ain't gonna come in here and tell y'all. I just had a, a terrible week. 
I want y'all to pray for me. I ain't going to do that. Because you know why? I have been called to grow up in him, put on my big boy spiritual pants, and say, you know what? You know, you, you got to grow up in the Lord. You got to grow up. You know, somebody else might have left you in your diapers. But if I'm going to be a father, you know, the Bible says we got thousands of teachers, but we got a few fathers. A father ain't going to leave you sitting in your poo-poo diaper. You know, I don't like changing them either. I got, I got one that's in diapers right now. I don't like changing them. You know what I do? I change it because I don't want my son sitting in his poo. And that's what, y'all don't, might not like the way I'm talking about this, but that is what is happening in the house of God. And we have to have fathers to instruct us and bring us up. That's why the church has got to return to an apostolic church in this day because the apostolic was a fathering spirit to the church. When somebody tells me the apostles and prophets don't exist anymore, I'm thinking, my God, we're going to have a house full of orphans because you ain't going to have no mother and no father. When you ain't got no mother and no father, you ain't got nobody to bring something out of you and nobody to bring it up. A mother brings forth, brings it out. You know, your, your mother, that's why your mama's special. She brings things out of you. But your daddy's special too because whatever she brings out, he's got to bring up. And it's, it ain't always easy. And it ain't easy in the house of God. This is a house, a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you. I ain't telling you you can't talk about your problems. You can talk about them. You know what I'm going to tell you? You need to start praising God because that's your faith. You know, you might want to pray. Praying is great. You can pray for your problem, but it takes a whole lot more faith. I'm trying to get your faith up to another place. It takes a whole lot more faith to start praising God for it than just to pray for it. Lord, I got to move. I'll move on here. Listen to this before I close. Many times we consider praise as an exuberant, lively, interjected, loud, extended arms, lifted. Worship is considered to be quiet, pensive, prostrated, bow, slow, reverent, ah. Uh-huh. It is not. It is not. Worship is not defined by a tempo. Worship is not defined by a song. Worship means to lower yourself. That you must forsake self-consciousness. I told you this last week. I'm bringing it back. To become childlike in abandoning thoughts of what other people think about you. That's what, when the disciples, you know, they, they were like, who's the greatest? Which one of us, Jesus? Which one's the best? I want the right hand seat and the left hand seat. Jesus said, ain't none of y'all. Come here, little child. Let me borrow you, Levi. Hallelujah. Jesus goes out there in the crowd. At, uh, I'm sure the, the disciples was like, oh, Lord. He says, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. How about that for a kick in the teeth? Amen. You know, that just really, lo- should, you should grab hold of that, that Jesus was trying to get them to the understanding that they needed to lower themselves. You know why? You can sit back down, buddy. Thank you. I'll give you a dollar later. (laughs) You know why that was special? Because little children, I've had five. I should know what I'm talking about. Little children do not care what other people think about them. They have not become self-conscious. Think about what Jesus is telling the disciples. He's, we're talking about worship. You don't worship because you care what somebody thinks about you. Somebody else is looking. God's looking. When that hits you, you think, I don't care what nobody thinks about me. Amen. Glory! Amen. When you get like that, I'm talking about y'all more at church now. I ain't talking about on your Sundays now. On your job. Oh, you're going to cause a mess now. Somebody calls you on the phone at work. They mad. They start cussing you. And you just say, praise God. I praise you, Father. I pray. Instead of saying, you know what, you blankety blank, I ain't got to put up with this. You just start praying. Does anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just say, praise God. Oh, I praise you, Father. They, they cursing me. I'm going to bless them. I pray 
right now, Father. Bless that Bless that filthy mouth, that tongue that keeps reviling and cursing. I pray, Lord, you said that sweet water and bitter water can't come out of the same mouth. But I pray, God, your blessing come over them. I bless them. Yeah. Mm, they think that you strange then. They'll hang up. Watch. Won't call back. <laughs> Priest, <laughs> they build and minister at altars. This is an altar. Not just this little rail up here. The whole place is an altar. We're building an altar of worship. Priests conduct worship. It is your job, Janie, Esther, everybody in here, Lori, it is your job to build up the worship. Amen. You have to build it up. I have watched through experience, watch and see, when somebody gets hit by the Lord, it becomes contagious. That's why I'm trying to get the constraints off because those of you that ain't never been hit, you're going to get hit. Amen. Oh, we've watched it. We just had ten nights of getting together in worship. And I watched Miss Linda over here grab her pocketbook and start heading for the door. And bang, right here. She got hit, threw down that pocketbook. I'm telling you. And I watched many of you get hit. I got hit. I've been a Christian 22 years, and I had never experienced anything like that in my life. I thought over there in that corner near the water fountain that I was just going on out of here like Enoch. I think I finally fell out on the floor. I had one of the most glorious times ever. I'm conducting worship. I'm building it up. Come on, build up the worship. Priests are called to an order. An order. I'll talk about that more later. Just write it down for yourself. Priests must be holy and sanctified. That gives me something that I'm reaching forward, stretching towards. Priests are to conduct themselves as royalty. I want you to come in here next week not thinking that you got a crown on your head, but think about what is under your feet. Amen. What is under your feet? God has already declared Lancaster as conquered territory. You just got to come in and begin to take over. We take over by worship. Did you know that Satan was a worship leader? He had musical instruments built into him. He's a great musician. Look at all the, the, the world's music. He inspires it. It is worship to him. That's what he wants. He wants the worship. When he hears you beginning to worship, he hears his replacements in heaven. We're, I wasn't created to just replace him, but he hears what he used to hear and what he used sound he used to make. You know, that's why I despise worldly music because that's the sound that I used to make. That sound ain't going to be heard in heaven. So why I want to be listening to it here? Oh, I just, I step on them toes again. That's okay. It ain't going to be heard in heaven and I ain't going to be listening to it here. Well, priests conduct sacrificial and sacerdotal services. I won't go into all the explanation of that at this moment. Just think about it that you come and you're making an offering and I ain't talking about just your money in an envelope. I'm talking about I'm offering unto the Lord my heart, my affections, my emotions. I am emotionally connected to my God. You better be. Because there's a lot of people that can pull your emotions all over the place. God ain't going to do that. He will make, he said, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Father, I thank you today. Lord, as we begin... Lord, to go through this in Scripture, that God, we begin to establish, Lord, a rebirthing in this day, Lord, even like David did. God, a house without veils, a house without constraints, a house without law, but a house, God, that is established by a greater law, the law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit, Father. Let the law of the Spirit be established in this place. Yes, Lord. Let the law of the Holy Spirit, which is life and peace, let it be established in this place. The law of liberty that has made me free in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. God of freedom to come over your people. If I could make a prayer to you, Lord, that I know, Father, then I could receive an answer to at this moment. It would be, God, that you began to release freedom.
liberty over your people. Holy Father, I know you hear my prayer. God, the liberty to worship you. The liberty, the liberty to praise you. The liberty to lift you up in this place. God, that this place become a sanctuary, a habitation, a house built up for you, Father. Lord, may we begin to build from this, Lord, from your word, to begin to build you a holy habitation in the midst of Lancaster, God. And I thank you for it today. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll see you tonight at 6.